Okay, good evening and uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, as uh, Mike uh, said already, I come from Vienna, from the University of Music. So I have to teach musicians in musical acoustics. Uh, and uh, of course we have a PhD program also for uh, musicians with scientific background. But one main task is uh, to give the music students an introduction into the acoustics of their instruments and the other instruments of an orchestra, for example. And uh, yes, and we are doing research uh, in several fields. Um, the institute exists for more than 30 years now, so uh, I think 32 years ago it was founded. And the name is Institute of Viennese Sound Style. And uh, this uh, has to do with the fact that the institute was founded because Viennese instruments, which are different uh, than instruments played uh, everywhere else in the world, uh, they, um, uh, there was a shortage of such instruments and instrument makers didn't know how to make them. Uh, so a research group was set up uh, to find out uh, how these instruments are to be made and uh, to cooperate with instrument makers uh, to get uh, this running again. And after several years, uh, several instrument makers started to produce uh, instruments for Viennese orchestras again. And the institute was already founded and started to deal with other uh, questions and uh, many, many interesting things. So I like to do research there and uh, for some time uh, we have a new building. Our group, uh, I can show you, this is our uh, group, not all of them are researchers. For example, this is the secretary and Sandra is uh, currently on maternal leave, I think, uh, that's what is named. And uh, Gregor is the head of the institute and he was vice rector at our university for some time. Yes, and the others are mainly uh, involved in different kind of research. Maybe you know Vasilis Hatsiyuanu. He worked uh, at Ned Edinburgh uh, together with Martin Walston. And he's now doing uh, simulations and modeling uh, for me and with me. Okay, and this is a good opportunity, opportunity to send some season meetings uh, from Vienna. <laughs> so this is our uh, team, our staff team. And um, there is also maybe you're interested in our lab, in our acoustical lab. This is the main room with the recording station with um, multi-channel uh, measurement microphones and uh, accelerometers and uh, uh, sensors, hard disk rec studio quality hard disk recorder and uh, uh, data acquisition system, AC and DC uh, for uh, uh, s different sensors and uh, microphones. We have high-speed uh, camera uh, for recording of uh, musicians playing their instruments, for example. And we can use this high-speed camera also in the optical lab, in the interferometry, to do transient uh, uh, vibration analysis on instruments. We have an optical lab with an optical table. Here we can do uh, ESPI, that means electronic spectral pattern interferometry. So um, maybe I should uh, encourage you to ask questions if uh, the level I, uh, I'm uh, talking uh, on is not appropriate. So if you need, to, uh, need me to explain some terms or so, then please don't hesitate and, and ask. Uh, electronic spectral pattern interferometry uh, is a method uh, to visualize the vibrations, the vibrational modes of uh, musical instruments or any vibrating surface. And as vibrational states of musical instruments are essential for quality uh, assessment, this is one of our, of our main uh, methods, of, of the most important methods we are uh, applying to musical instruments. You can see uh, a violin here, yes, and uh, on the computer screen you see then a modal analysis looks like that. So it shows uh, the pattern, the modal, the vibration pattern over frequency. And uh, this is a stationary analysis, but we're using the high-speed camera. You can also do transient analysis like 
uh, hitting uh, a timpani or plugging a string on an instrument or something like uh, like that, or uh, you know, playing uh, a, a wind instrument. It's, it's nice to turn off the light here. chamber, a quite a uh, good size unequipped chamber. Um, it's uh, rugged enough uh, to carry a piano in this room and we can do acoustical and optical measurements at the same time. That means uh, this uh, optical table uh, from outside can be moved inside the chamber. Uh, to do interferometry uh, inside the adequate chamber and uh, we have uh, a trolley to carry a piano in, uh, in that room. We did radiation measurements on, uh, on a, a, a true piano, for example, using this microphone array. You can see 24 microphones here in a quarter circle. This is a kind of a sta stage box connected. And we can rotate the instrument on a rotational table to get the radiation field in the same sphere, in the same sphere. So this is our playing ground, and uh, here our research is done. Let's look into some research projects going on at our institute. I I'm going to present a research of myself and a research of my colleagues. So maybe I start uh, with a study. Uh, done uh, by Bernard Goebel, a, a colleague who joined uh, quite recently and uh, while uh, the rest of the team has specialized a little bit on, inst on musical instrument acoustics, he comes from the performance uh, science uh, uh, branch. That means he's studying musicians uh, while they play and he's uh, studying the interaction uh, in an ensemble, in an orchestra, uh, timing relationships, or uh, uh, how they synchronize uh, uh, their, uh, uh, their performance. And he gave me a short introduction in current projects. This is a project done uh, with Caroline Palmer from the McGill University in uh, Canada and uh, they are together working on a PLOS publication. This is Public Library of Science, an online publication uh, with a peer review. And they study the, the technique of pianists. And uh, they use motion capturing to determine the, uh, the activity at uh, finger joints uh, during playing. And they compare uh, uh, expert players and uh, beginners. And uh, they compare different uh, tempi it means uh, fast and slow, and uh, they try to find what is important uh, to uh, become expert player, and uh, yeah, and which movement properties are related uh, to performance measures. That means uh, could this uh, kind of research <coughs> provides feedback to musicians, um, feedback <coughs> is given to musicians by their teacher anyway. Uh, but this kind of research tries to confirm theories uh, or to confirm. Uh, the way uh, the playing is taught <laughs> at our university. And for example, this is the motion capturing system which was used in Canada. We don't have such a system in Vienna. And uh, it works by applying uh, uh, points, reflecting points to the joints of the hand. And several cameras are uh, uh, tracing the movement of the joints and the movements of the keys of the piano. And uh, yes, uh, Abbreviations, PIP, PIP, and MCP are abbreviations for main finger uh, joints. PIP is the, uh, is the phalanx, is finger, and uh, I don't remember the abbreviation. The, the, three, the three joints active the piano playing is DIP, PIP, and MCP. And then there's a wrist angle and wrist, uh, wrist, wrist angle and wrist rotation. Those who know how to play piano will already know that uh, pianists try to keep the wrist rotation and the wrist angle uh, constant and they try to keep this angle constant. And the question was, is this true? Is it uh, really uh, 
can can it be proven proven that uh, this is uh, the way to play uh, good music or uh, fast uh, transitions? And this was investigated here. For example, a, sing a, a single scale, a simple scale, and then. Uh, you can get from the system the set position, that means the elevation of the, of the point, of the joint, for example. And uh, uh, this is uh, the fingertip, uh, and we are looking into the third finger at the moment. So it's uh, this finger. And that means it's used twice, playing the C here, playing the, the C here, and this is where the fingertip uh, presses down the keyboard. And other finger joints, joints for example, uh, have other curves here, and, the, and the, the wrist movement is actually quite uh, uh, small. That means especially the, the wrist angle uh, is constant, almost constant, and uh, movement is not very pronounced, and there's not much wrist rotation. But we can compare this uh, between different players, for example, between a normal player uh, who has only had 15 years of piano lessons and doesn't uh, practice so much, maybe one hour per day, and an, an expert player who practices much more and uh, is much more experienced and is also uh, performing publicly. And when we compare, for example, uh, the timing error and uh, the standard deviation of the onset interval and uh, the key velocity and you can see that the green expert, the green is the expert, has a much more steady uh, timing, uh, almost a zero uh, timing error and uh, the onset interval, interval uh, is, uh, yeah, especially if you can especially master higher tempi, the, the x-axis shows the plate tempo in tones per second, that means the, the right end is 16 tones per second, it's quite fast. Um, and the, the medium player, the red player, stops performing here, so he cannot do uh, faster than 12, uh, 12 tones per second. And especially the control of the velocity, where well, you can see uh, there are differences between, between the uh, master and the fast player and the normal player. And this video should show a good and a bad performance. Well, I will show this in a different window. You can see the right hand of the, of the player on the right side is much more economic. The movements uh, are much more economic than the movements of the other player. He's moving around the hand. Uh, the joints get even negative angles when, when, when he presses the key. And yes, this is a reproduction uh, generated from the data of the motion capture system. And this is uh, the result, let's say the result, uh, the relative joint contributions to fingertip motion. And here you can see, for example, the green player, the, the, the expert player, doesn't move the first joint at all. That means he keeps this, this first joint completely constant. Uh, the second joint is almost constant. And the, mo the, 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 the main action comes from the third, from this joint. And that's how <coughs> piano uh, playing is supposed to be. And the wrist, for the wrist, uh, he's not moving the wrist at all, while uh, the, the red player, the, the beginner or the, uh, the poor player, moves the wrist very much. And what does it mean? He has to compensate for this wrist movement uh, by moving the other joints. And you can see uh, unnecessary uh, movements in the other joints, which are needed to compensate the strong wrist movement uh, of his hand. So this kind of results can be uh, can be obtained uh, by this data. Another project of uh, Werner is uh, to study the synchronization and communication in music ensembles. So this is a different kind of project. We got funding uh, for the for that project. It will run from 2012 to 2015, 
and he's still looking for the PhD student to do this research. So it has just started. So if someone of you is interested, he, he told me to advertise uh, this vacancy. Um, <coughs> so three years PhD uh, can be done in Vienna on synchronization, communication, and music ensembles. The aims were to combine motion capturing with timing analysis of music ensembles. I just can give you some preliminary things. Uh, uh, we started, or he started already to record a quartet, a string quartet, in different environments, in the unequal chamber, uh, in a kind of studio, in a performance hall, uh, in an exercise, uh, in a practice uh, environment. And he tried to create uh, the, the onset synchronicity uh, of all four players using sensors on the instrument and using data of this kind it should be studied whether the acoustic environment for example uh, changes the synchronization of these uh, of, the, of the players uh, and maybe with motion capturing and with video control it, it might also be studied how they synchronize that means if they uh, if, if they give cues uh, <coughs> about the timing or if they watch each other uh, or if they just listen and things like that so uh, as this project will start soon. Uh, this is just preliminary information and yeah, describes about uh, approximately what Werner uh, 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 is doing at the Institute. Good, something else, another project, which is done under the supervision of Werner, uh, is a PhD student the PDF, a PhD student studying performance of saxophone playing. He's a saxophone player himself. <coughs> and uh, this is a cooperation with the Technical University of Vienna. And uh, at the Technical University, they are building a sensor clarinet or a sensor saxophone. That means uh, they make uh, thin film sensors, uh, forced sensors, uh, which can be built into the keys of a clarinet or the, or, or the keys or rings of a, of a saxophone. And um, uh, these sensors um, uh, can deliver a time series of the pressure, the finger pressure on, on the key. Uh, and not only uh, one sensor per key, but three or four sensors per key. That means it can also be uh, uh, um, detected whether the force uh, is axial or whether the force is from the side or how, how um, uh, pitch bending is done and, and things like that. And also there are sensors on the reed uh, monitoring the action of the tongue during play. That means when does the player use the tongue to change uh, the reed displacement or to dampen the reed to dampen the note and things like that. How long does the tongue, for example, stop the reading, what how to play? And how far are tongue and fingers synchronized? This is so this is the sensor saxophone with, uh, is with simple sensors. The clarinet will get uh, 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 custom made sensors with uh, uh, other sensors. And this is uh, the reed with a strain gauge uh, built in and uh, players are not disturbed when they play this so that they don't notice uh, the sensors in the read. It works quite well. <coughs> and their view is used to uh, do multi-channel recording of all these uh, data streams. This is an example for the data we can get. Uh, top uh, row is the sound. Uh, next row uh, is uh, the read displacement. Then we have key forces. At, uh, on, on three different keys and uh, the score which was played uh, for this uh, record, record, recording. Let's look at one note for example um, and zoom in into the data. We can have the sound. This is uh, a, a bending between two notes <coughs> and this is how a beat uh, vibrates. So there's obviously a stop between the two notes and we have key, a key force with some interesting features here. So this is read oscillation during sound production. When the read is damped uh, by the tongue, <coughs> then uh, the oscillation stops. Uh, 
Here is the time read contact and time read release times. All these uh, features of the signals are extracted by computer programs automatically. So the key bottom uh, is here. It means the key uh, closes the hole. And then, oops, the, yeah. and then some extra pressure uh, 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 is, is exerted on, on the key. And then when the note already sounds, some unnecessary extra pressure is created by the player. So all this would not be necessary. The key is already closed. So preliminary results of this study is <coughs> that tongue and uh, fingering is important to keep the timing, which is already known. Uh, but uh, as, uh, the, if, if uh, fingers and tongue are both used to, uh, to play timing, then the timing is much better. So improved temporal stability for combined tongue and finger movements. And the difference is you, you could play uh, do, 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 do on the same note, or you can just do, just uh, uh, articulate using the fingers, or you can do both, do, 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 do yeah? fingers and tongue. And this uh, provides the best uh, temporal stability. And uh, yeah, other features are interesting and uh, can uh, give a feedback to the player, for example, uh, when uh, the force is much higher than required. So, and um, during the project, it will be investigated whether expert players and uh, uh, students uh, uh, have different techniques, especially in this respect. That means maybe uh, we can create a feedback device for our students to tell them uh, to not to exert uh, extra pressure which is not necessary or to compare uh, their uh, uh, time series uh, with the time series of an expert who has played the same piece before, for example. So compare different playing techniques, compare different phrasing techniques. This all uh, is intended uh, to be studied during this project. Could I just yes? So sound cells are developed inside your university, or you actually work with another university for the sound cell? Uh, well, uh, we are working inside a University of Music, uh, but uh, we are the only scientific institute uh, at the University of Music. The most other institutes are teaching how to play music, and there is cooperation between institutes. That means sometimes if players have problems uh, with, with their performance or with their instrument, they come to us and we try to find a way to, to, to spot uh, the problems and uh, to help the students or teachers to overcome these projects. But, uh, uh, did, did you not say that the, the actual sensors were being done? At the yes, the sensors have been developed at the Technical University and it's a joint project. Mm -hmm. That means we applied for funding and two universities participated in the project. <laughs> the Technical University uh, did the sensor development, which was also a, a challenge because uh, of, of the small size and, uh, and, other, and other conditions which have to be met. And uh, the idea was that they build the sensors <coughs> and we study the performance. In reality, it happened that uh, they had difficulties uh, producing the sensor, developing the sensors. Uh, and while uh, we didn't have a sensor clarinet, we had to uh, improvise a bit <laughs> and use, use a saxophone and put uh, commercial sensors there to get some uh, time series to start with and to study the, uh, to write the programs, to do the data analysis and to study the first preliminary data curves. And meanwhile, the sensor clarinet is ready so uh, the real uh, study can start. The whole project is uh, for three years and after one and a half year now we have everything together uh, to, to do a performance study. <coughs> a completely different kind of study is done by Vasilis. Uh, this was a project initiated uh, by a, a Swiss uh, um, by a Swiss company or uh, association dealing with uh, historical instruments and especially with the viola da gamba and uh, they intended to uh, to reconstruct an old uh, viola da gamba from uh, from uh, images or from paintings like the one you can see here. It means from different kind of paintings they tried 
to find uh, the features of a specific instrument and then they ask an instrument builder uh, to build something which looks like that and they ask us to determine whether such a thing can play also or can, can sound properly. And uh, the most important difference to normal instruments is that they don't have a sound post. The sound post of a violin is a small uh, piece of wood which connects uh, the top plate and the bottom plate and which is very important to break the symmetry of the whole thing. A violin or any string instrument is symmetric if you look from outside. But a symmetry in a vibrating thing usually uh, is, uh, means that it's not efficient to radiate. That means if it's symmetric then it doesn't radiate efficiently. So the symmetry has to be broken somehow and it's broken internally, internally because um, uh, one foot of the, of, of the bridge is supported by the sound post and the other foot of the bridge uh, is glued to the bus to the base bar. There's a base bar uh, glued to the top plate from the bottom. You don't see it. You have to look into the F hole to see it. And these old instruments they didn't he didn't have uh, sound post and they didn't have base bars. Uh, that means they wouldn't radiate efficiently. Usually this is not a very big problem because in the past music was not as loud as today. Uh, musicians played in front of a uh, of, of few people only, mainly in front of the king and the queen and so on. <laughs> and uh, instruments uh, didn't need to be very loud. But later on the, uh, the uh, rooms got bigger, performance rooms got bigger and the audiences and so instruments had to become louder. So the, 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 the aim was to build an old instrument without sound cost and without bass bar, bass bar uh, which radiates quite well, as, as, uh, as good as, uh, as well as, as possible. And that's uh, where Vasilis came into play. Um, here he's using a finite element simulator to simulate uh, not only the structural behavior of the instrument but also the radiated sound. That means we can combine a structural uh, uh, finite element simulation uh, uh, with the which uh, results uh, in the vibration modes <coughs> of uh, the instrument. And we have an acoustic part which is connected to that structural simulator. And uh, this can calculate radiation fields. That means you can put a microphone uh, in a virtual distance of this virtual instrument uh, and listen uh, to, the, uh, to the sound it creates. But this is quite computationally expensive. So um, uh, it's difficult to get a, a complete piece of music this way. Uh, you only will uh, do it for certain frequencies and, uh, and, and things like that. So, um, <coughs> especially, the question was especially how to shape the thickness of the top plate to break the symmetry and to increase the efficiency of the radiation. And he simulated a symmetric and an asymmetric uh, combination of the top plate. Uh, and compared uh, the uh, structural behavior, the, the, the modal um, uh, characteristic, and uh, the radiation characteristic of such an instrument. We got this instrument in a CAD format, in a CAD, computer aided design format, from a designer in Switzerland. It was quite difficult to import it uh, into the, into the uh, simulator, but anyway, um, the challenges were uh, the pre-stress on the top plate because the strings exert some uh, static pressure uh, because uh, of the tension of the strings and uh, so the, the top plate uh, is under pre-stress and um, well uh, the fingerboard and the neck uh, was not simulated in that case we just concentrate focus, uh, put focus on the body of the instrument uh, admittance, mechanical admittance, that means uh, vibration characteristic of the body and acoustic efficiency uh, were to be simulated. And radi radi radiation patterns at different frequencies were to be calculated. And this is the result. This is the, the finite body, mm -hmm. the, the better one, the, the better version of, of the, of the uh, instrument body as, an, as a 3D mesh. And this is the bridge admittance. Uh, resulting from this simulation. Uh, you have the frequency on the horizontal axis and you have the mobility of the bridge uh, on the vertical axis and this curve indicates where the, the body uh, exhibits resonances. That means of each peak here is a resonance of the body. That means at these frequencies the body will uh, at least uh, vibrate if not radiate. Uh, but uh, 
uh, vibration uh, is a requirement uh, for radiation. Not all, fre uh, all vibration frequencies will radiate efficiently, but this is the first step. And uh, this instrument has quite a normal bridge admittance, that means it would be recognized uh, as a viola. And uh, here is the sound pressure level in some distance at a specific frequency. As uh, you can see, this is one, only one frequency point, and I think it calculates for some time, so it's uh, difficult to get uh, much data using this method, but it was good enough uh, to get the design which works, which doesn't break, because this is another uh, uh, important thing. If there is no sound post between the top plate and the bottom plate, then the force of the bridge might overstress the top plate and it might even break if, uh, if the static uh, was not good enough. So uh, the simulation was also used to confirm that the static of the instrument uh, will stand the, the, the tension of the strings and will not break. Yeah, this was one of uh, Vasilis' pr uh, projects. Another one, which is started here, I think, in Edinburgh, uh, was the project with uh, Martin van, van Walstein. <coughs> it was modeling a, a, a clarinet uh, sound generation. That means a uh, sound generation of a clarinet, uh, but the problem when you uh, invent a model which can simulate uh, a playing clarinet, you usually need a lot of material parameters and geometric parameters which you do not know. Uh, to, uh, it, it's a constants which you cannot design properly. So the idea was to, to measure certain characteristics of the vibrating reed and, uh, uh, and, and um, in, in, inside pressure inside the mouthpiece and from this measured curve, curves of a real instrument, you can somehow determine the simulation parameters which are required uh, to create a simulation which matches the observation. This is an inverse problem. Inverse problems are usually difficult and uh, often uh, require optimization to get that. Optimization often is not uh, converging, so uh, convergence of optimization is an issue. Uh, so he invented a, a two-step procedure, uh, a rough estimation of the most important parameters uh, in a very stable and uh, robust or rugged uh, uh, optimization step, uh, it's a simpler equation, and using these parameters as a starting point for the second optimization, which actually uses the forward model, that means a complete uh, model with all the non-linearities included in, uh, in, in, in the loop, and uh, this optimization is then used to adjust the initial estimates and to recover the remaining parameters which are required. And the result here um, is, I'm, I'm shown here, uh, is, uh, the first test for such an inverse problem is always uh, to, to uh, recover an, a simulated curve. That means you calculate a curve yourself and try to, uh, to uh, regenerate uh, this curve using uh, the inverse problem. And the requirement is that the, uh, the, uh, uh, the recovered curve needs to match completely uh, the synthetic curve. And this does. That means uh, the optimization converges and it's possible, it's basically possible uh, to derive parameters uh, from the, 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 the sound pressure and sound flow in the mouthpiece. But the, the real test is to, to apply the whole thing uh, on measured data, on unknown characteristics. And this is the matching which was achieved uh, for, uh, for any uh, measured data. And you can see it's quite, it works quite well. Uh, optimization is stable and it could reproduce uh, the flow and, and, and the pressure quite well. Um, the only thing which is not known yet is how these parameters, these one, two, three, four, five, uh, nine parameters, are changing with time when a player plays the instrument. So this is the next step of the project. It means uh, uh, using short pieces of recorded signals and uh, reconstructing all these parameters uh, again and again to see how the music, how the musician uses the tongue to damp the reed or, or to, to change the, uh, the equilibrium distance uh, or uh, uh, to, to change the, uh, the lung pressure, PM is the pressure of uh, the playing pressure in the mouth and other things. So the, uh, the idea, or the, the, the main goal is then uh, maybe to uh, create a controller for a player who can pl play a virtual clarinet like he would uh, a real clarinet. And, uh, yeah, and this is the first step.
for such an application. Another project Vasilis is doing with myself. <coughs> the background of this project is that that um, musicians and instrument makers all the time uh, stress the fact that instruments built from different material uh, would play differently and would sound differently. And uh, the classical opinion of uh, scientists is that the acoustics of uh, wind instruments, especially brass wind instruments, is determined by the shape of the air column. The resonator is not the brass, the resonator of such an instrument is the air column. And the shape of the air column contains all the information which is required to reproduce the sound of the instrument. This is the, the classical view of uh, wind instruments, especially of brass wind instruments. But uh, the makers and players uh, all the time uh, claim that uh, the, the material has uh, some effect, especially thin walled instruments, have like different response and different sound than thick walled instruments. And we tried uh, to look into that problem and to either uh, confirm uh, the effect of the wall material and the, and the vibrational uh, behavior of the instrument, or uh, well, uh, to, to say that, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the classical view is correct and the musicians, musicians uh, they, yeah, they're not able to tell what they feel or so. And we did experiments. The first experiments were quite simple. Um, we used artificial lips and artificial mouth to play a French horn, for example. And while this instrument was playing for one hour a constant, uh, constant uh, pitch and constant uh, sound, we filled the box uh, with sand and the sand damped uh, the vibrations of, of the brass. And we recorded the sound, the generated sound. And uh, it was clear that the sound timbre was changing as soon as the sand uh, was, uh, was able to damp the vibrations of the bell. So this was a strong indication that there is something uh, which has to do with the, with the vibration uh, of the instrument. Then we did um, more uh, uh, accurate measurements with input impedance and uh, transfer function with and without sandbags and compared the results and we still found some differences, smaller or bigger depending on uh, some other uh, parameters which we didn't understand at that time and then we started uh, to find mechanisms, to search for mechanisms which could explain that there is a difference between a vibrating uh, bell and a rigid bell uh, from concrete for example. And um, this project is quite advanced meanwhile and uh, has two aspects, the vibroacoustics of brass wind bells. This was the first thing we needed to understand. What is the interesting uh, vibration uh, mode which can affect the acoustics? Uh, we knew already that there are several vibration modes which obviously do not affect the acoustics. This we knew from other research and from our own observation, but obviously there is some vibroacoustics which does matter. And the next is, uh, if these vibroacoustics uh, uh, matters, how can uh, this vibration, uh, these vibrations modify the internal sound field, the air column, uh, to be noticeable to the player's lips, that means at the input uh, plane, or uh, to, the, to the audience, that means uh, at, the, at the end of the bell. And uh, we did together with Thomas Moore uh, interferometric uh, studies of uh, vibrating bells, of vibrating trumpet bells, and here you can see uh, what you get. Uh, these modes here are usually named as normal modes, or uh, strictly speaking, uh, that are deflection shapes. And they are well known. That means structures like that would exhibit such vibration modes. Uh, that means uh, there are several <coughs> different types. And the strange thing which we noticed in, this, uh, in these things is that the white uh, areas according to the to method we applied, uh, would show nodal areas. That means no motion at all, while 
uh, when you look at the pattern, you would assume that the nodal and the nodal regions would be in between the antinodes here, for example, along here, along here, or along here. That means what we see here is some kind of superposition. We have the, the typical uh, uh, opposite phase vibration uh, named as normal modes, but we have something else, which is a common mode vibration, which is on top of that. And here is here are other other modes. Uh, they are well known. They have high high quality and so on. And they look like that. So this is how these normal modes usually uh, show up in the simulation. But the second kind of motion, which can be uh, which is visible in in, in these uh, interferograms, is a motion like that. That means uh, the whole bell. Uh, is vibrating like a piston or like a speaker membrane and this is a mode which is effective in radiation. So this is a kind of mode which can affect uh, air column. Uh, any uh, counterphase mode will uh, be short circuit, will not radiate efficiently because uh, of the wavelength and acoustic short circuit and so on. But this kind of movement might be effective. So we started, we started to study this kind of movement and this is a simulation. Um, uh, find a different simulation. And the interesting thing was, uh, if we change the mass uh, distribution of this instrument, if we put, uh, for example, a heavy mouthpiece, uh, then the bell amplitude is much uh, higher because this is the center <coughs> of gravity. That means this part and this part have the uh, same uh, mass. And if the mouthpiece, for example, is fixed, uh, uh, maybe by the player's uh, teeth or uh, uh, head, the mass of the head is connected to the mouthpiece, then this amplitude is even more uh, strong, is even stronger. And another thing uh, we noticed later, the frequency, the main resonance frequency of this mode can be tuned. If you put a spring here, like a brace of a, of a trumpet, a string here, then you can tune the, the structural resonance in a very wide range. That means uh, the bends and, and braces of, of, of real instruments, they can affect this kind of vibration uh, dramatically, I would say. That means uh, uh, if this frequency is usually uh, 700 hertz or 600 hertz, you can move it by bracing the instrument between 400 and 900 hertz. So it, it's it, it, almost the whole playing, playing range. Uh, this is a console, a final element simulation of this mode, just the same but uh, nice colors. And uh, this is a comparison of a three-dimensional final element simulation, is the red curve. A two-dimensional axisymmetric uh, finite element simulation is the blue curve. And a finite difference, a simple finite difference uh, model, uh, which, is, which calculates uh, maybe several orders of magnitude faster than the finite element simulation. Um, but all these models basically reproduce uh, the same uh, kind of, of curve. You can see the red spikes in the 3D simulation and as you would assume these are the normal modes, the elliptic modes which only occur in the three-dimensional simulation because they require the third dimension. Everything else is axisymmetric and cannot be cannot capture normal modes. Um, here is a special mode which is again very interesting because it's an uh, important uh, mode uh, below 2 kilohertz and it's a ring displacement. Uh, the electronic speckle, in, speckle pattern interferometry shows a nodal uh, circle here and a strong antinode uh, where the rim wire uh, is situated. That means uh, this is the uh, equivalent uh, finite element simulation. The blue is a nodal line which doesn't move and the red is a maximal, maximal displacement. And, and this frequency, the, uh, this uh, uh, ring frequency, is very dependent on the mass of the ring wire. That means if you, if this, this wire, which is usually um, enclosed by the material here, is a bit thicker or a bit heavier, then this kind of frequency uh, will also be different. So the ring wire is an important uh, part of this structure, structural resonance. Yeah, uh, I talked already about the boundary conditions. Rim and mouthpiece mass are important, uh, uh, bends and braces are important, and the player's embouchure because the, the mass of the head fixes the mouthpiece, and uh, this also changes. This is a comparison between a model and an experiment. Uh, red and uh, uh, yellow is experimental data using with a laser Doppler interferometry at the bell, 
and at the mouthpiece. So this is the difference between mouthpiece motion and bell, uh, and bell motion. And the blue is a simple uh, uh, finite difference model. And the main uh, resonance is uh, matching perfectly, perfectly. So you, you, you get uh, exactly where it is. And this red resonance here is what I showed you before, is this Oops, the rim modes. This mode, and this is not captured in the finite difference simulation because the rotational moments are not included in the finite difference simulation. Homsoil would show this mode. And uh, the reason why we can say this is because the red curve was taken at the rim and the yellow curve was taken one centimeter uh, inside the rim, where we assume the nodal line. And you can see uh, the, the rim mode only occurs in, uh, at the rim itself. And if you move to the inside, then you even have an anti-node here. And uh, if you uh, if you don't model uh, this uh, this rim, then you get a second resonance of this, which is uh, which could be uh, this resonance in the experiment. We try to model this uh, acoustic interaction. That means the, the oscillating wall will create an extra sound pressure inside the air column and a flow into the wall and uh, both contributions uh, can be calculated and taken into account when the input impedance is calculated you calculate it either using console or using transmission line um, techniques and uh, this is how the, how the transmission matrix uh, matrices are modified uh, by extra pressure so the internal pressure is the air column pressure plus an extra pressure which is created by the oscillating volume and the internal flow is the air column flow plus some uh, contribution due to the flow into the vibrating walls. And if you do this, you can even separate the, comp the contributions. The blue curve is the, uh, is the input impedance uh, of the air column and uh, the green curve is the contribution due to the vibrating wall and near the <coughs> some neighborhood of the, of the structural resonance uh, you come quite close, so this is less than a factor of 10, uh, the, the contribution of the, of the sound pressure due to vibrating walls. And if, if you compare uh, the input impedance with and without uh, uh, vibrating walls uh, between experiment and the model, you, you get uh, curves like this. That means this is a difference in input impedance between damped and undamped, and uh, the, the, the top, top level curve is the experiment and the bottom level curve was a console simulation of the whole situation. And meanwhile, uh, we have a finite difference model which uh, creates just the same matching. And then uh, the, the model was confirmed, as uh, the structural model was uh, in a way confirmed by experiments and the acoustical model was confirmed. Next thing is, and how, what happens when we vary the model parameters? It means how, uh, what can we expect as a variation when we, when, we, when we vary model parameters? And the first thing we were varying was the wall thickness of the instrument. And um, this dashed line is uh, one resonance, one tone, one uh, natural tone of the trumpet. And this is another resonance. And the red line is the structural resonance, this uh, longitudinal um, uh, oscillation. And you can see by varying the wall thickness by tens of a millimeter, so this is maybe 0.4 millimeters up to 0.5 millimeters, uh, you can generate up to 2 dB uh, difference in input impedance at one resonance. And well, in that case, you don't see much at the other, at, at the other resonance. But if, if you vary uh, mouthpiece mass and rim radius in reasonable uh, 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 regions, then you get again plus minus 2 dB at this resonance and a little bit at the, at the higher resonance. And you can even apply a lip force because usually uh, the vibrating lip exerts uh, an oscillating force to the instrument. That means uh, it's not only acoustically driven, it's also uh, 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 structurally uh, excited. And uh, this was a very conservative simulation. I was assuming <coughs> um, one newton for oscillating force from the lip. Uh, when you calculate the lip mass and uh, the frequency uh, the lip is playing and, and, and uh, the oscillating part of the lip, uh, then I think one newton is a conservative assumption. It probably will be much more when, uh, when a player plays uh, loud levels. And then you get a strong influence. That means 
uh, again about uh, plus or minus of one a half or one to be up to even two uh, dB uh, in one resonance. A little bit less, but still significant differences at the next resonance. It means this structural resonance cannot only affect one air resonance, but uh, several in the neighbor neighborhood. And a higher resonances might affect other uh, uh, tones of the instrument, other uh, uh, air resonances. So uh, we are studying this currently, and uh, in, in we are uh, just writing a paper on, on the model and on the experiments and the effect. And, and uh, we think that uh, vibroacoustic model is confirmed, and the acoustic interaction is also reasonably uh, reproduced. And uh, well, and we study now the effects of lip motion, the effects of uh, material and, uh, and braces and, uh, and, and geometry and, and things like that. So we are quite convinced that wall vibrations do matter, and they can matter significantly depending on, on, on the environment. Good. So there are also other projects. I don't have enough time to, to, to talk about all the projects. Uh, uh, one colleague of us uh, is uh, a specialist uh, in organology, and he studied, for example, 16th century trombones and tried to find out about how they are made. I will skip through too much of that. He was cooperating with another university to do X-ray fluorescence measurements on the 16th cent century trombones. And uh, here are some cross-sections of the material. And uh, they had the hypothesis that, uh, some, that the, the brass used in these old uh, instruments is equivalent to the brass which was used to create uh, 42 uh, coin-like jetons which were made between 1550 and 1600. Uh, I don't know in which museum they can be found. Um, and it's true, so uh, the, the experimental uh, results uh, imply uh, that they had a certain material available and this material was also used for the instruments. And uh, one interesting finding of, of, um, of them was that uh, different kinds of brass have been used for these instruments and uh, this instrument has been changed uh, 50 years later after uh, initial construction. He could identify the parts which were not original because uh, of the composition of the, of, of, of the brass. Uh, here uh, is the result uh, that uh, old, old brass contains a tin content of about 15 to 20 uh, percent um, and newer, uh, newer samples of brass contain a higher tin content and modern brass even uh, has a tin content of more than 30%. And this was the way uh, to identify the different uh, um, uh, origin of a uh, different part of this instrument. So you could group the parts according to uh, age. In, uh, an interesting uh, observation, there was aluminum uh, in the instruments, and aluminum was not known in, in the 16th century. So the question was, how, how come that uh, there is aluminum in the samples? And uh, if they uh, went into that, they found out that aluminum was only in the patina, in the, in the outer uh, layers, and obviously this came from dust or from cleaning liquids or something like that. So this uh, is not an indication that uh, it was used in the past. It, uh, aluminum, I think, uh, came up in 18th century or uh, even later. So, well, and there is still the question, uh, is the material relevant to the sound of, of these brasses? And uh, this parallels uh, the, the, the research we are doing and I am doing with, uh, with Vasilis. And as vibrations and, and structural mechanics is obviously um, uh, important. It's of course important uh, from what material these instruments are made, especially as this material is, cannot be compared with modern brass because it was uh, manufactured uh, manually with hammers and, uh, and uh, uh, much uh, different uh, manufacturing process than modern uh, brasses and even the thickness is not constant. And, <coughs> and this kind 
of uh, treatment increases usually the damping very much. That means it has a completely different acoustical uh, characteristic than modern uh, brass. And it makes sense if you want an old instrument to rebuild an old instrument, it makes sense to use uh, a corresponding material if you want to come close to the original sound. Good. Uh, do you have questions? Or do you want to discuss things? I will say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or proposals, what to do, what to do next? Uh, you bet, uh, anybody else want to start off? Some of these results will not be uh, too surprising, I guess. Yeah. Um, maybe we start at the, uh, at, at the more or less at the end. With the, the, the wall vibration stuff is, of course, yeah. always very interesting, and then things obviously develop a bit further since I was sorry, I just talked to you. Um, so that looks very nice. Um, The this this uh, the longitudinal kind of uh, resonance you look yes. at is is a pretty high Q one by the look of it. No, it's not so high actually uh, compared to the normal modes. Yeah, it's much the, much less. Well, one of the one of the things you showed had a, had a very big spike. Well, the, the finite difference. Well, this one. Yeah, uh, this Q uh, can be any Q depending on what material damping you assume. So, um, so you, mean you, you use an unrealistic. Uh, we are using a damping, complex, yeah. uh, a complex Young's modulus uh, to simulate uh, the quality of this resonance, the damping, mm -hmm. the damping of the material, and <coughs> a standard value of brass is between 0 0.001 up to 0 0.01 or so. So it, there's a, a range, and uh, I'm sure that this historic brass has a much much higher damping. And depending on the number I input to the model, I will get anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to get this kind of matching here, wait a minute. Yes, I, I thought these this was to get this kind spiky. of matching. Yeah. Oh. I have to assume quite a high damping. Mm -hmm. uh, that means obviously the damping inside the, the material of these instruments is higher mm -hmm. than a material scientist would expect uh, for a typical brass. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and this has to have, have to do with the uh, treatment because uh, when you make these bells, you have to uh, shape them and uh, heat them up and shape them and heat them up several times. Mm -hmm. And there are many uh, manual procedures where uh, stress uh, is applied to the sheet that obviously uh, the damping is higher uh, than just in industrial brass. Presumably that, that will affect the other modes as well. Yes, of course. Yeah. But not so much. The, yeah. the other modes are still much higher, one order of magnitude higher, yeah. higher, higher Q factor yeah. uh, than. And even this one here. So these are. I don't know exactly what kind of uh, Q factor, what kind of damping I need to use to match the, this observation. Uh, but actually, this is not a very high, uh, not, not, not a very high damping. Okay. But uh, yeah, uh, it's an, again an inverse problem. I have from measurements, I have to find uh, the damping which is required to get uh, the observation, to, to uh, reproduce the observation. And uh, then we have to talk to material scientists how this uh, kind of damping is uh, achieved during the manufacturing process. And obviously the variation is bigger than usually expected. Mm -hmm. So we can't use the damping values from industrial brasses. But they are realistic, they are still uh, they are not, not unrealistic. And it's not required that they match the air column resonance. That means it's enough if it's between two air column resonances to affect both of them. Yeah, well, I mean, that, that's related obviously to the Q value. Yes. I mean, as, you know, you're 50 hertz away and we're still having a significant effect. Yes. Uh, yeah. you, you can see uh, if the peak is 50 dB, for example. Uh, then 30 dB is quite narrow, but 20 dB is already uh, from 800 to nine, uh, from 800 to, to 900 Hz. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask, in the case of, uh, like in the case again of uh, the wall vibrations, if the bell plane is... Uh, excuse me, uh, here you see the relationship between the Q factors. 
this is the Q factors of the normal modes, and this is the Q factor of the structural mode. So it's mm. the same brass, mm. same parameter. The reason why this Q is not so high uh, like that is because it's, it depends on the shape. Uh, it's a distributed uh, oscillation. Because of, 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 the, of, of the shape, uh, you have not the same stiffness everywhere. So the, the stiffness is a function of, of axial distance, and the mass is a function of axial distance. Mm -hmm. That means, uh, actually, it's, it's a distributed oscillating system, and that's why it's not uh, as sharp mm -hmm. as these kind of oscillations are. Sorry. So just if the bell plane is moving, do you expect to see uh, any kind of self-modulation or side bands appearing? <coughs> well, uh, the bell, the, the, the very last plane, um, is some open question yet. Because inside uh, the instrument, uh, the pressure and flow can be calculated easily. But actually, uh, it's an oscillating length of the instrument. That means the last slice of the air column uh, will uh, oscillate between a certain finite diameter and infinite diameter. Um, so in, in the, in the same is true for the wall flow. So what happens at the very end of the instrument is still an open question which is not treated in the model. What is your question? Well, I'm just wondering if the, if the instrument itself is moving while it's vibrating, would you expect ah. to see modulation yes. or sidebands? Um, less than loud speaker effect. Yeah, yeah. Double shifting. <coughs> yes, uh, but <coughs> the instrument is moving at the plane frequency. Yeah, it's, it's not moving at different anything? frequencies. Hmm? Do you observe anything like uh, double frequencies or uh, no, no, no? no. Uh, it's still a linear system, isn't it? Uh, linear time invariant or not? I guess is the question. Uh, if there are, yes, uh, if, if the structural resonance and the air column resonance match, then you will get something, or almost match, then you will get something like Wolf tones. And this was observed in organ, in, in trombones or organ pipes uh, by, uh, by the French group. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but if they, do, if they do not match, uh, then uh, you have a linear generation of sounds. That means uh, all the harmonics of the played note will be radiated somehow, and uh, there will not be created uh, additional components. The, the structural resonance will be the forced vibration, the forced vibration state of the instrument. <coughs> isn't it? Well, it's, it's delicate, I suppose, isn't it? It's, it's not whether it's linear well, or not. Well, you're it's right if you talk so about transient phenomena, but in, uh, in stationary things, if, if you, if you well, I guess set the, the whole is, thing in... Is, is it okay to think of it as a linear and time invariant system still, if the boundary itself is uh, well, yeah, if, if you take transient phenomena into account, then you need to think about these things because the transient phenomen phenomenon will uh, stimulate all frequencies and it will stimulate uh, these resonance even uh, if you play uh, something else, uh, some frequency different from that. But in a stationary uh, uh, state, uh, you will stimulate part of it, for example, if you sound it here, uh, then the structural vibration will be excited to that level. And if you uh, play it here, then, or if you have a, a, a harmonic component mm -hmm. here, uh, then it will be played at that level. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if you imagine doing a, <coughs> a vibrato with a slide of the trombone, well, yes. uh, and then you increase the frequency <coughs> of the vibrato until it reaches the play frequency, that, that's more or less what's happening here, isn't it? Yes. That's On a very small scale. That you can do. <laughs> And uh, well, if you play it uh, directly uh, very near to this resonance, then you will, might create uh, beating and wolf tones and so on. Yes. Clearly, yes. And you, yeah. Okay. Do you have another question? You look like you. I've got lots, but I'm, I'm going uh, <laughs> to just uh, ask all the other questions. Later, <laughs> so, uh, anybody else? Any questions? perhaps draw things to a close right, for the moment and uh, people will pursue you rapidly <laughs> afterwards. I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don't forget there's a vacancy in Vienna. <laughs> <laughs>